Warning, this episode may contain bad words and probably discussions of gross stuff. It's what we do. It's 1848, and we join two men in an insurance office. Hello there, sir. What brings you to my old-timey insurance office? Well, hi there. I'm here to buy some of that insurance you're selling. I don't want to burden my family if something should happen to me. Well, you've come to the right place. Let's start with some basics, huh? All right, let's have your name. Uh, It's Phineas. Phineas Gage. What a unique name. All right, well... How would you describe your overall state of health? Well, I'd say that I'm more neurobilious these days. I used to be fibrobilious as a youth, but fortunately, I seem to have grown out of that. Just look at the fullness of my scalp, the thickness of my skin. I think I'll, I'll take your word on that one. Thank you. No, I, my skin is so thick. Moving on then, what sort of business are you in, Mr. Gage? Uh, well, I'm an independent contractor, as they say. Right. And uh, in, in what field or trade? Explosives. Come again. I'm an explosives expert. Uh, fireworks? Demolition, maybe? Mm-mm. Nope. Yeah, I work on the railroad. See, we've got to blow up these rocks to build the railroad, right? I see. Yeah, so we make a hole, we fill it with gunpowder and sand, and then I take this large metal rod. Oh, oh, you, you brought a large metal rod with you. Right. Yeah, I take this here rod and I stuff it in the hole. The hole with the gunpowder, is it? Yep, that very one. So I put this rod in there and I hit it with my sledgehammer. You do what now? Well, I have to tamp the gunpowder down or else the explosion won't rip the rocks apart, you see? Uh, okay, okay, of course, of course. Yep, and then we light the fuse and kablam! How do you know your striking of metal rod on rock won't actually spark the gunpowder? Maybe, maybe you want a wooden rod instead. Oh, nonsense. I've been doing this since I was a young lad. You need to use a metal rod. I'm an expert after all. Don't take this the wrong way, but I think our company may be a bit hesitant to insure you. It seems as if you have an unusually risky job and we would almost certainly be paying out one, if not multiple claims when something eventually does go wrong at your work. I don't know that this policy is in the best interest of our company, I'm afraid to say. What if I went ahead and made the end of this rod super sharp, like a spear point or something? Would that help? No, it absolutely would not. Oh, man. Maybe you should try something safer. I hear the mining industry has a good track record these days. Oh, do they? In 1848? Nope, I was kidding. Yeah, well. Well, can I has insurance now? <laughs> nope. Nope, you cannot. For historians. For historians. For historians. We look at cases throughout history. It's just Max and there and Mac and me. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, the podcast delving into the archives of medical history. We will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. How the hell are you all? I'm awesome. Totally awesome. Same. Yep. Do you guys do you guys feel different today? Is something yeah, different? I, have this, I have this feeling that some long held dream has been fulfilled. I don't know where that feeling comes from, though. I'm not sure. It, Maybe it's because we're... Mike, is that what you feel, too? Um, yeah, I really do. I know I don't <laughs> sound very genuine, but yes, so happy. <laughs> I'm so happy. But, but, but why do you feel that way? Uh, well, one reason would be that we have a published podcast, so that was fun. I got to listen to you guys talk. Awesome. Yep, we have published the show. It was uh, and still is in process, so I'm getting us up on all the directories. So for anybody listening, please look for us. uh, Well, you've already found us if you're listening, I guess. So we will just be looking for us across a bunch of different places and uh, make sure you tell, yes, like, subscribe, hit buttons, tell everybody, you know, and we will update you as we go forward. Also wanted to mention at this point as part of publishing this podcast that uh, we are establishing a social media presence. So 
Uh, that means I have us up on Twitter. You can follow us there at Poor Historians. That's Poor underscore Historians. Uh, I started an Instagram page as well. That is Poor Historians Pod. First time I've ever done the Instagram thing. I'm not a geriatric millennial. And you that's can Facebook, visit us at our it? website. Uh, oh, that's true. Because I am most, fam- I am most familiar with mm-hmm. Facebook, yeah. so that is true. And you can also go to our website www.poorhistorianspod, all one word, dot com. Don't put in the all one word. It's just poor historians. <laughs> State your name. So awkward. <laughs> all right. So for any new listeners, here's what the show is all about. Though we are all practicing emergency physicians, we wish to be clear that this is not a podcast from which you or anybody should take medical advice. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. If we should fail in our goal to provide entertainment, well, I guess this podcast is just a thing that exists. It exists, however, to definitely not provide medical advice. And so with that, let's start the show. All right. So today we're going to talk about Phineas Gage, one of the most famous workman's comp cases ever, and uh, often used as an argument for the idea that personality sort of, I guess, lives, as it were, in the front of the brain. Uh, Even my middle school son, who does go to a STEM school, was like, hey, isn't that the guy who got shot in the head or something and was really mean after that? Definitely part of our curriculum in medical school, although to be honest, I can't recall which class it was in. I think neuroscience or, yeah, the neuroanatomy, neuroscience, I'm almost 100% sure it came up mm. during that time. Yep. Well, we, yeah, it was neuro. And then later, did we have a psych class? Man, I don't even remember. <laughs> we did have <laughs> a psych class. Did we? Yeah. Yeah. It's, oh, I did. I, 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 we didn't go to the same school. So we didn't? I, uh, <laughs> did we? No I, no, I don't think we did. No, we. No, I don't think we did either. We definitely had a psych rotation and a class, but I, I think he came up there too. Regardless, so this Phineas was born in 1823, apparently because a lot of our great medical history comes from the 1800s exclusively, as the oldest child and was very healthy for the time, a fact everyone later thought was important when the plot thickens. The early 1800s, uh, also prior to sterile surgical technique, if we remember from other episodes, and before even refined Civil War medicine, and most likely before OSHA as well. Uh, I do like, just... I like the call back to episodes that I don't know exist. You could say episode. <laughs> it could be a future episode. Mm. It, yeah, yeah, that's true. All right. We'll, we'll just let our you listeners. You don't have to we'll listen to these temporarily. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> Time is a construct. Please, Aaron, that's continue. Right. Yes. You don't even know if it's linear. Uh, he was described as super healthy by his doctor with a strong, this is in quotes, nervobilious temperament, which in the thinking of the day meant he was naturally suited to labor, possessed of a an iron will and an iron frame is another quote. So very interesting to me how physical exams and medical notes have changed over the years. I want to know all the variations of nervobilious. I want to know, <laughs> is there cardiobilious and Depending on bilious, does it matter which bile, right? There were four biles. Mm-hmm. There's it like black to. bile, yeah. yellow bile, something yeah. else. I, I like to think I probably have a lot of black bile because I did hang out with the alternative goth crowd <laughs> in high school. That's how it shows up. Yeah, it causes you to eyeliner? just have to dye your hair black. Yes. I didn't. I did not, but you know, I could have tried harder back then. Gage was a railroad worker in Vermont in his 20s, and I don't know if Wikipedia has a little libertarian streak or what, but it was even mentioned that he was perhaps an independent contractor that did explosives work. Uh, He liked it so much that he had a local blacksmith literally make a custom iron bar for pounding explosives. That's back when tools meant something. You had your own tool. It was custom made as opposed to just going to Home Depot and buying your own iron bar for pounding explosives. True, true. Have you guys ever, Old World Wisconsin actually uh, is has sometimes a blacksmith literally making stuff like there and you can watch. It's, it's an amazing trade, but that's a segue. So. Absolutely. So to make railroad tracks through rocky hills, they would bore a hole, they'd put powder in the hole of rock, they'd put sand over that, and then tamp it down to direct the blast into the rest of the rock they wanted to remove. And Gage was apparently like an expert, so... What is, what is the, how do you become an expert in that? You uh, survive mm-hmm. 10 you years doing survive. it? Yeah. Yeah. You're willing to be the one that does this job, I think is probably what qualifies you. It's 1800s after all. In, in medical school, somebody had a saying, and I, I can't, I think, uh, I don't remember who it was, but they said, uh, you know, basically being an expert is you have slides and you go to a different city to give a presentation. <laughs> yes. You are now an expert. 
Yeah, so he had a PowerPoint that he took to New Hampshire, right? <laughs> His iron bar weighed about 13 pounds and was about three feet long, so a large piece of metal. One happy day, Gage was sort of pounding away at a blasting hole and somehow it sparked or something and the powder in the rock ignited with the iron bar in the rock and it shot the iron bar out like a like a cannon. Weird. Uh, and poor Gage was standing over the hole at the time. So the entirety of this three foot piece of metal went literally through his head and landed about 25 meters away, like something straight out of Army of the Dead or whatnot enters just below the left eye and goes almost straight up and out the top of his skull, obviously knocking him back. But incredibly, he's he's walking around soon after the accident. There's some blood, but not a ton. He can still see initially, but obviously doesn't feel that great. So he takes the rest of the day and the, the doctor sees him when he gets back to town. Uh, there's even wait, some- did, wait, hold on. Did he, he had to finish out his shift? <laughs> No, he took the day. Like the, the foreman oh, was I like, see, "That's I okay. See. You you take you take a minute. You're like, you don't have to come back today. That's fine." <laughs> oh man, if you could just imagine the stairs, like everybody was just probably just silent, just staring at him, <laughs> not knowing what to say. Because what do you say? Staggering around. I mean, if he got himself, did he get himself up? Can you imagine that scene? I. It's gotta be crazy. But he was, uh, you know in a good enough mood that when the doctor shows up, Gage actually reportedly makes this joke and says, Hey doctor, here is business enough for you. <laughs> but then after he says that he throws up and a little bit of his brain literally pops out the top of his head from the action of vomiting and lands on the floor. As <laughs> reading that I'm like, it's so gross. There's a five second rule in neurosurgery though. You just get it right back in there. <laughs> just right back in before anything jumps on. The, uh, the doctor cleans him up, leaves the wound partially open, uh, crucially not exploring the brain extensively to get stuff out, despite uh, how happy they were at the time to go sticking stuff into bodies to get bad things out. There's a report he removes, quote, about a teacup full, quote, of brain matter. But uh, through the whole thing, Gage is relatively indifferent. And as we say in the business, uh, the patient tolerated the procedure well. <laughs> he did develop a pretty bad infection. Uh, not a surprise. I mean, it I don't think the bar was sterile when it went through his head. Uh, had to have an abscess drained, at which point the doctor also uses silver nitrate on the exposed brain, which, I mean, we use silver nitrate, which causes heat on contact with moisture to cauterize no nosebleeds. I, maybe we're underusing it or, or missing a hidden application. He got quite sick, but then went on to recover pretty well, to be honest. I mean, all things considering the fact that he survived at least that much madness. That's uh, that's something to be said for the old nervobilious constitution. That's right. His his iron will. Yeah, it's a great detour, though. Like, how exactly did he survive this this horrible injury? So sobering truth that you can anatomically do a ton of damage to the front of someone's head or face and have them survive. Um, I've seen a few cases, actually really tragic cases that this made me think of in the modern era where we don't use blasting irons, but we do use firearms. Um, and people will attempt suicide and they aim from below, but too far forward to actually kill themselves with these like horrible facial injuries. I had a colleague in med school, I think, who had one of these cases on a team of doctors. Uh, it was like ENT and plastics and ophthalmology and everybody sort of reconstructed a person's jaw with part of their rib and rebuilt a tongue and all this stuff. Um, but, you know, just everyone felt bad, even though their life was saved. I mean, you feel bad enough to do something like that and then you wake up after 12 hours of surgery with a rib for a jaw, man. So shout out to crisis lines and suicide prevention. Yeah. I don't have yeah. jokes here. No jokes. It's yeah, a same. true story. I have definitely, I think I've taken care of that type of case before. Um, this, you know, Phineas, so that was an accident, right? He, he would, he'd certainly, he was feeling good about that iron bar. So it was not in that state of mind. The brain definitely has the basic physiologic systems for breathing and alertness at the core and at the base. So it's no surprise he could breathe okay and didn't necessarily go into a coma. Uh, motor control is a bit further back from his injury as well. So structurally, the front of the brain is more related to higher functions that aren't as needed for immediate survival. And incidentally, why lobotomies are an actual thing that doesn't cause death. Also, another wonderful episode for the future. The other big thing that kills people with blunt trauma is bleeding inside the skull that causes pressure and pushes the brain, squishes it down or across and so on, which causes brain death from the squishing, either across structures inside the skull that subdivide the brain or down through the big hole at the base of the skull. 
And um, there is so, a there there is definitely a heck of a term for that, is there not? I, I think there is. Yeah, I think there is. Mike, it what is that term? A... Wait, what are you getting at? Uncle herniation? Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, that's what you were getting at. Not on I was just getting at herniation, but you threw oh. out the uh you, you, you took it to the next level. Yeah, well I, again, I thought maybe you had some sort of funny term for it. No, is when you have to think about what, radiation. guess what I'm thinking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and then the big hole at the base of the skull. I, I mean, foramen magnum is, I mean, that's a great band name, <laughs> good brew name. Who knows? You know, in, in medical school, we did try to start the metal band obturator. Nice. Which refers to a small muscle in the pelvis as well as a nerve, because there are plenty of great metal band names without throughout the entirety of anatomy. Yeah, no, that's true. So this, uh, this squishing or moving happens much more quickly in the base of the brain around the cerebellum in the back of the head, simply because there's much less space and because the brain has to be able to drain the brain juice it lives in through a small funnel, which is also at the base of the skull called the fourth ventricle. Um, and if that's blocked, pressure builds up quickly. But I do hope that when we talk to our neurosurgeons at work, that's exactly how you describe the physiology of the brain to them. Definitely. And juice. Or if you do an LP, like, oh, we don't have enough juice. <laughs> Gotta get, get more juice. Spine juice. <laughs> it's like that time, the, the first time I remember when learning to do a lumbar puncture, aka a spinal tap on a uh, infant, which has come up a fair amount. Um, if it's not running briskly, because you're just taking these tiny little drops out, if you massage the soft spot in the skull and you push on it, you get a few extra drops out. No way. <laughs> You've never that done is, that? Mm. No, I've never done that. You know. I, oh my I, gosh, it works. You just. Like, I just, hey, just wait, but tiny, tiny little bit of uh, just little massage to the front soft spot of the skull and get a few more drops out. It's. Oh my gosh! One of my, it's just one of those favorite things I've ever learned. Yeah, that's a great hack. I gotta say, doesn't work on adults, so. Well, no, it's, it's skulls it might work closed, on Phineas. Close to new ideas, it might. Um, yeah, I mean, in his case, he was lucky, in air quotes, because the, the bar left a defect that allowed for drainage into his own sinuses, which is so awesome, um, and through the top of the head, so the pressure didn't kill him in the first day or two. I mean, I think that's definitely part of the reason he he survived. The huge discrepancy between the injury and the survival was was a curiosity at the time, definitely. So after he recovered, he was in some museum exhibits. Uh, he got to tour some of the medical schools and meet students, uh, take his bar with him and such. Um, the rest of his life, though, is really not as terrible as one might expect. He he recovers. He works for quite some time as a stagecoach driver in Valparaiso, Chile, which is a great rebound job, if you ask me. It feels like stuff like that was definitely easier in the 1800s. But on the other hand, syphilis was was untreatable. So, you know. So that's not entirely true. People... The people did treat syphilis back then. You could either inject mercury right into your genitalia or you could take it, you know, by mouth. But uh, this, it's it's just not accurate, Aaron, to say that syphilis was untreatable. <laughs> I'm sorry. I forgot about the... Not technically a good mercury. treatment for <laughs> syphilis, but it's still treatment. Is that where hot beef injection comes from? <laughs> I think that's different. Oh. I love how they just took heavy metals and thought maybe this will work, like silver, mercury, you know, lead. Let's just silver. <laughs> it does turn here. apparently. Uh, yeah, no, apparently a lot of them turn your tongue black. So they're like, oh, it's doing something. Sure is. That sure is true. Is. That is true. And now we cured syphilis. We don't have syphilis anymore. <laughs> yes. After two he fully rec- two thirds of this podcast doesn't have syphilis anymore. Right. While well, the other one just has to get the, you know, the chronic treatment. I'm not going to violate HIPAA. We won't say who. <laughs> no, no. Secrets. After he fully recovered a year or two after the injury, he lasted another 10 or 12 years, um, eventually developing worsening seizures, which would be a, a known complication of severe brain injury. He died of status epilepticus, a condition where uncontrolled recurrent seizures go on for hours or a day and the body just essentially succumbs to the metabolic consequences of the constant muscle contractions and such that go along with seizures. In true 1800s fashion, doctors later get his skull from the family and the metal bar, and he's still on display at Harvard, uh, both his skull showing the injury path and the bar itself. Um, The rest of Gage is happily interred somewhere else, I hope. 
he, he had first given the bar to Harvard a year after the accident, but I feel like that's kind of a sad display on its own. They just have the bar all clean and such. That's not as great. He got it back and he sort of kept it with him for the rest of his life. I mean, he did originally ask to have it made for him. So uh, the only two known photos of Gage have him posing with the spike itself. That's pretty incredible. It's super interesting, though, some of the fallout from the injury. A whole bunch of people sort of hop on this story and draw a narrative that is partially true, but maybe doesn't entirely fit events. Again, even my son, as I noted at the start, knew Gage as that guy who got mean after he was shot. Many people drew a clear line where he was this great, hardworking, temperate New Englander before and this cursing, surly, mean miscreant afterwards, and then talked about how that proved various theories about the brain. You know, obviously, if you survive an injury, but it changes your personality, it stands to reason that's where personality lives, right? I mean, seems to track. Yeah, and I think you may be getting to this a little bit uh, in a little bit here, but uh, I, I think we've all kind of seen frontal lobe diseases. There's certain ones like strokes or some forms of dementia that basically remove parts of the frontal lobe or at least the function thereof. And it leads to very interesting circumstances where there's some nuance here, but some people completely lose a filter. So they will say the first thing that comes to mind, there's no checking as to what they're thinking. And there is, there's something I almost envy about that. Because as long as it's understood, that's why you're saying it, you kind of get to say whatever you want because there's literally no stopping it. And that's, that's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to hear what people are saying in their internal monologue when they say it out loud. <laughs> truly with no filter. And it makes you wonder as you walk down the street and stare at people, what they're actually saying to themselves on the inside that does not make it out. Our, our society would crumble <laughs> within a day if or nobody get a lot had better. any filter whatsoever. <laughs> well, maybe after the, the period where we all hated each other for mm -hmm. a little while. It happens with anesthesia too. You do uh, sedation or whatnot. You get a lot of interesting things out of people when the medicines affect the frontal lobe for sure. Yes, but, you do. I mean, the 1800s, I don't think they were there yet. The, the best theories at the time came from phrenology, which was a branch of really bad pseudoscience that thought people's personalities and such were determined by the shape of their skulls to some extent. It too definitely deserves its own episode. But along with the shape of the skull, they put different tasks in different regions of the brain. So animalistic functions were closer to the base of the brain or closer to the body and higher pursuits like morality and such were closer to the top of the head because, you know, the top of the head is closer to God. So that's where the morals are. <laughs> but they were right, because though. Of that. But they were right. <laughs> and that's why. Uh, they were why totally giraffe, not wrong. Yeah. yeah. That's why giraffes are the most pure creatures walking the earth. Absolutely. <laughs> Plus they have the little antenna, right? Like on the top, like they... They're closest to God and they probably have a Wi-Fi connection with. It's it's like the Sears Tower, like it was super tall, but then they add the spike on there just to make it. That's right. Quote, break the record. And that's, 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 that's bullshit. That's cheating. It is cheap. But is anyone even close to the giraffe's record? I don't think so. There's not like a second tall animal that's that. Anyway, they're head no. and shoulders above the rest, as it were. Wow. No. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to apologize to anybody <laughs> listening for that. Well, you certainly could edit that in later. So people use Phineas's proof that he got really mean because the top of his brain was damaged because he damaged his, quote, organ of veneration or his, quote, organ of benevolence. Those are the little sections in phrenology. They also thought people needed like a whole compartment of their brain to compare stuff to each other. And they used some stories of how he had a hard time with prices at the local store to prove that he had injured his quote organ of comparison. I mean, that seems like a lot to make a whole organ for that. But most of these changes were not confirmed by his own physician or his family. So dubious, dubious claims. Looking at it with 21st century eyes, it makes much more sense that he had a lot of trouble early on, but recovered later. I mean, what we start to know about severe traumatic brain injury, the guy was certainly crabby and felt unwell because he was injured and then he had a brain abscess uh, and then the blast and the skull fractures along with it almost certainly caused a lot of invisible trauma outside of the areas of the brain that ended up 15 meters away or got sneezed out the top. I think we're finding out that the consequences of traumatic brain injury are complex, but absolutely include prolonged changes in mood and so on outside of the loss of one portion of the brain. 
But when it's a single injury, the, the brain can recover over years and improve. I mean, it's super fragile rather than one specific spot in my mind that holds on to benevolence or temperance. These parts of us we kind of rely on the brain as a whole working well. And while he was still healing, I'm sure that was all disrupted. It was probably disrupted a, a little bit by the spike through the head. I agree with you. Yeah, but again, it went through the frontal lobe and that does influence your behavior and your personality. Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. it was probably everything working together. But yeah, that would suck. I mean, especially back then. You know, he's probably hooked on yeah. laudanum. He's going to the <laughs> the <laughs> right. house call doctor. I need more laudanum. And then they gotta check the PDMP and be like, listen, you got laudium laudium laaudanum last week. <laughs> <laughs> you just Order gotta from fil- Sears like everybody else does. Filter through the pages. He starts coming up with pseudonyms. He's like, no, that that was Phonius Gujer. It's my cousin. Phonius Gooch. I got this. I need that one medicine that begins with an L. It always works. Mm-hmm. Oh. La, 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 Laudanum? Oh, yeah, la. yeah. That's the one. <laughs> no. No, I think, I think there is something to the idea that the brain subdivides tasks or functions. I mean, definitely certain parts of the cortex can be damaged in specific ways that cause syndromes and frontal strokes can cause decreased concentration and personality changes or more subtle symptoms in rare cases where strokes in the back of the brain cause incoordination. So yeah, I mean, the brain definitely subdivides. In trauma though, it just, to me, it feels like the brain is just really, really fragile and that global symptoms have to do with long, slow healing and remodeling more than any specific discrete organ. Indeed. So that's the story of... Phineas Gage, misunderstood like all of us, but managed to live his best life in Chile despite having a three-foot-long iron bar shot through his cheek. It's just funny that this is one of the cases where the doc really did nothing and he survived. And we're going to go over cases where the doc did everything and they died. He probably thought he was going to die. He's like, I'm just going to make this guy comfortable. He's got a huge hole in his head. He's done. Oh, I'm sure. And and honestly, given the time and what they knew back then, that was probably the right move most of the time. You know, they're fishing yeah, out bullets from these people. They're causing all kinds of infection because, yeah, I get it. You know, a bullet doesn't seem like it should be in the body. But in fairness, when you're introducing non-sterile instruments into all these areas, you're you're doing more harm. So there were, and I'm sure it will come up in a future episode, but there were definitely other physicians at the time that said, maybe we shouldn't do stuff. And they were, they were looked at uh, with derision. Even in the 1800s, the floor was too dirty. I think that's clear. I mean, the brain went on the floor. They're like, yeah, that's not salvageable. I just don't pick that up. Yeah, it's like when people bring fingers in after they cut them off and they're all just in water and macerated and gross. Like, why don't you put this back on? (laughs) Because we've learned from 100 years. (laughs) (laughs) It's every time I take care of somebody that gets shot, I'm always thinking like, and kids ask this question a lot, like, where would you want to get shot? You know, like Phineas Gage gets shot in the cheek, does fine. You get people like get, you're like, oh, I'll get shot in the butt. But you get shot in the butt, you get x lapped, you no. get like yeah. uh, ostomy. Like there's no good place to get shot. I guess that's the disclaimer. <laughs> you don't want to get shot anywhere. There's good Tangentially places to be in the calf muscle. No, but then you can't walk. Yeah. Tangentially in the lateral portion of the deltoid maybe on your non-dominant arm but, but what not happens through if the it, bone yeah if it courses and then it gets you a new more hits the subclavian artery yeah no good don't get shot <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, well wow. i can there are definitely worse places to get shot you know i mm. mean if you happen to have a gun that you put in your pants and you decide to put it in the front of your pants facing down you know that that could just end up kind of like a exploded hot dog in a microwave situation. Just theoretically, I, I would say that's probably not the right place to shoot yourself accidentally. No, in the not that I would have any experience that, with that at all. That might be the first uh, hot beef injection. <laughs> Yes, sir. There's nothing like working outdoors. Hammering metal rods into gunpowder holes all day long. Mr. Gage, you you want me to do that next blast hole? Uh, no worries at all. I'll get it. Oh, Oh, my God. 
Oh my God, are you all right, sir? Uh, so I'm gonna get the foreman. What's all this yelling about? Uh, uh, it's Phineas. He he was tamping that there hole, and, and there was an explosion. Well, of course there was. Isn't that the point? Uh, uh, no, it, it went off while he was hitting the rod. I, I think he's really hurt. Oh, nonsense. He's fine. It's not time for your 15-minute lunch break just yet, Phineas. Come on now. Let's get back to work. I, I don't think he's all right, sir. He appears to have head injury. Oh, he's fine. Dust him off and stand him up. Hard to find decent labor these days. Everybody wants to take a break. I think there's a hole in his head. What? How did that happen? Well, it, it may have had to do with this explosion and, and, and the large rod he was hitting with that hammer just prior to the explosion. Let's not jump to conclusions. If it had anything to do with that, we can't be sure. Where is the rod, anyway? It's over here, covered with brains. Well, then how do we know he was striking it with the appropriate angle and aggression? Was he using a company rod, or did he bring his own? Surely if he deviated from recommended practices, the company will not be held liable for his carelessness. Uh, dirt. We need to get him to a doctor. If it will shut everyone up so they can get back to work, then fine. But I'm counting that against his break time. That's a bit cold, isn't it? Her, her, derp. I think you're overreacting. He seems no worse for wear, but if you think the doctor is necessary, it's fine to take him. Thanks. Come on, Phineas. Let's get you some help. Uh, whatever. I think he's fine. Achoo! Oh no. He sneezed out part of his brain. Better take that with you. Oh God, where, where should I put this? Uh, back where it was, I guess. I'm not a doctor. Right, right. Good, uh, good thinking. Off you go. Don't dally. And don't forget the most important thing. Uh, 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 to tell his family what happened? What? No. Be sure to get a drug test. Sure, sure. I, I will do, boss. C come on, Phineas. Now he needs a doctor for sure. Yes. Yes, he does. <laughs> All right. So let's see what we've got going on in the, the old archives of the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal from Wednesday, June 7th, 1848. So I found a couple of articles contemporary to the, the time that uh, Gage was injured. It actually occurred just before he got injured. And this is from a physician writing in the, <laughs> in writing in the journal here that had strong feelings about how head injuries were cared for. And part of it was just observations of what happened with certain people who got injured. But uh, there's a few parallels I think worth bringing up. And I think more more than anything, just the some of the phrasing they use is pretty amazing. So let's, uh, I'll go through uh, two of the cases here. So Dr. Shipman's cases of injury. So case six here is called, or he titles it, Fracture of the Right Parietal Bone, Fungus Cerebri, Death, No Operation. So he's, he's, some of these actually feature the patient's names. He omits it from here. So he says, Mr. Blank, age 20, was wounded on the head by the limb of a tree falling upon it. The scalp was torn up and the right parietal bone fractured and comminuted, that being a bone kind of the side of your head towards the back. A doctor was called who picked out several loose pieces of bone and dressed the head with some kind of poultice. Mike, do you use poultice often? Um, only when I'm... No, no I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, all do you do you pull all this? the time? Yeah, it's standard. I, I, you know, crush the herbs together and then I spit in it and I kind of rub it around in my palms and then I just slap it right on there. Patients really seen... like it. I, yeah, they, they yep. think it's cool. Yeah, poultice is a. I absolutely had to look this up, so I had the definition correct. But it is typically plant material mashed up into a soft mass, and then it's applied to some wound to try to bring down inflammation and. Uh, covered with a cloth or dressing. I did have one patient once who had a large wound and had it packed with tobacco, which in fact did work to stop bleeding. It was just kind of a bastard to get it all out of there. Yeah, it's probably vasoconstrictive. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. 
Yeah. I, I don't remember it going well in Game of Thrones. No. The poultice no. in general? No. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anything went well in Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. but I think the poultice part was bad. So returning to our 20-year-old, no symptoms of compression followed and the senses were unaffected by the wound. He took physics several times and stimulating drinks were freely given him on the first. He went on in this way for about four weeks when a tumor began to form over the wound. This tumor grew rapidly and the patient soon became feverish and incoherent. A surgeon of skill, now was called, <laughs> who found a hernia cerebri protruding from a laceration in the dura mater. He also found that the scalp had not been laid down over the wound, but kept open to let the discharges pass off. As the attending doctor said, it was hazardous to cover up such wounds until they healed at the bottom. I'll spare you some of the other stuff that this guy says, but he is not a fan of wounds healing from the bottom and thinks this is ridiculous. (laughs) The surgeon last called advised the cutting away of the fungus cerebri and applying compression. And as the patient had fever to employ counter irritation, alternatives, etc. But he was overruled by the doctor in attendance and the friends of the patient who preferred to have him cured by the stimulating washes, poultices, and salves, and the tonics and stimulants that he was using. The patient continued growing worse from day to day and finally died about six weeks from the time of being wounded, much to the astonishment of the attending doctor. (laughs) Really? They were astonished this person died? Yeah, I know. I know. So then it goes on to detail like an autopsy, but moving past that, the best is the remarks from the physician who is writing this article, which I, (laughs) I just, there's a few little things here. So remarks for certain reasons, I have not given the names or dates in this case. We had here a common case of injury of the head, badly treated. The patient lives several weeks under the most absurd and outrageously unskillful treatment that can well be imagined. (laughs) Oh my gosh. If the spicula of bone had been removed carefully, the scalp laid down, the hair shaved off, adhesive plaster and light dressings applied, and the dressings left undisturbed for 15 days or more, the patient in the meantime, being kept low on diet and inflammation properly met as it supervened, it is probable that no hernia cerebri would have come up, nor the patient have died. Just throws everybody under Ooh, the bus. That's a rough M and M. Like, wow, you suck. And it was in public too, right? I mean, it's all. Post. Oh, this is yeah. This would be a public journal, like you that know. That is crazy, insane. So I think what they're describing. I mean, correct me if you heard it otherwise, but I think basically in in the the terminology of the day, yeah, this guy had a skull injury. The wound became infected, and I think the. Uh, he describes herniation and discharge. I can't tell if that's brain sticking out. I think it is. Plus, yeah. probably surface abscess, right? I would think. Yeah, it's got to be an abscess. Like. That's what it sounded like. Yeah. yeah. So I like how they call all bad things fungus. Like there was a fungus. It's like it's not a fungus. Yeah, it's it an is. abscess. I mean, or... There's probably some fungus in there. I mean, fairness. Well, but... true. Yeah, that's probably true. Right. The abscesses. Yeah, but the uh, yeah. So uh, and. I like that this guy his 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 hang up is like they should have gotten the skull out. I mean, he would they would have gone into the brain and fished out the skull. It would have been fine. <laughs> would have been great. Yeah, it totally would have won. Closing so it later would have been a good idea. I mean, there would have been possibly some benefit, but I don't know. They would have gone in there with like a probably a tack hammer and mm. well, maybe it was the pulse poultice. The poultice, yeah, the plant matter on the surface of the brain hole probably didn't help. Yeah. I agree. No, I don't think so. You know, modern times, we always talk about alternatives, right? You're like, well, you could do this, and then your alternative is X. I mean, imagine then you're like, well, uh, we could do a poultice. Uh, your other alternative is a salve. Uh, also, we have plaster. Or lastly, I could give you a stimulating drink and some combination there. I mean, I mean, you could take a physics class. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everybody got colonics. Everybody, <laughs> colonics are used so much, like brain injury, colonics. I, just amazing. Like, yep. Good bowel movement. I think somebody even pain. tried colonics as a form of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. There's a book hmm. on that. Like, yeah. No, really days. We, yeah. Drowning maybe victims. Just... They, had, they blew smoke up their butt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then the, the other case, I'll, uh, same, same guy, case 12 here. There were many others in between, but case 12 fracture of cranium recovery without operation. Miss S age 19, was thrown from a carriage by the running away of a horse on June 5th, 1847. 
She struck on the curbstone, and a wound was made by the corner of a post, above the right superciliary ridge. Miss S. was taken up entirely insensible and carried into a public house nearby. I saw her in about an hour after the accident and found her in a stupid condition. (laughs) I wonder when the last time somebody wrote stupid condition in a medical journal was. It probably wasn't that long ago. Probably 70s, 80s. (laughs) It's... Man, this, this is stupid, man. <laughs> I read, I, I, I LOL'd when I was reading that for the first time. Uh, Given the choices some of our patients make, yeah, well, probably write that in the yeah. chart. That's this stupid is something I've made, else. I, I've made bad choices, let's be fair. She had vomited a short time before my arrival. On examination of the head, I found a wound of the scalp over the frontal bone on the left side. It was small, but extended to the bone. I enlarged it a trifle to examine the bone more perfectly. A fracture was distinctly visible with slight depression of one side. She was cold and the pulse small and weak. In a short time, however, she became warmer and the pulse more full. This was near the evening. In the course of the night, reaction came on and venesection to 16 ounces was performed. Do you know what venesection is? I had to look it up. I do not know. It's just bleeding. Fancy term for bleeding, so... She's uh, her pulse is getting better. Let's take some blood off the top is the way I read that. She has regained her senses in a great measure, but there is numbness to the left arm an inability to articulate distinctly. Also headache, flushed face and the right eye closed by ecchymosis. June 27th. Fever. Pulse strong, full and hard. Left arm very numb with inability of using it. Then a section to 12 ounces oh. with relief. Cathartic of calomel. And <laughs> they, gave her, they gave her a cathartic she oh, is oh no. god and some abbreviations i literally don't understand but well, that's like mud jacking head. a sidewalk you know you increase yes. the pressure in the brain then that skull fracture isn't depressed anymore it pops out you know what <laughs> that's one way to fix I, it yeah i was i'm just yes mm-hmm. absolutely then they applied cold to the head which is elevated in the room darkened they actually got that right. We still elevate. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Yeah, so we got something right. We elevate the, you know, in severely injured patients with high pressure in their skull, we do elevate the head of the bed so that there's a little bit less pressure. So, you know, we stumbled into one here. I hope June they took the cervical collar off. That's important. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. June 28th, headache and fever continue. Gave calomel as cathartic and continue cold to head. And then he goes, it is unnecessary to continue the daily report of this case. The fever gradually subsided in a week's time. The arm regained its natural sensation and motion. The ecchymosis, meaning bruising, went off from the eye, and I dressed the scalp in 10 days from the accident when it was perfectly healed. And then his remarks, mind you, this is his own case, of course. This girl was strong, robust, and plethoric. The injury produced severe concussion, and there was probably some slight effusion, whether beneath the pot injured or more deeply seated. No inflammation followed, and she recovered perfectly, and it has been quite well ever since. If there was effusion of blood, meaning bleeding on the brain, I believe here, it was absorbed most probably in that too in very short time. In closing, nailed it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah I was waiting I for the trephination. Yeah, I know, come on. He, there is a trephination. Some of these are really long and... Yeah, wandering. But uh, so I, I do enjoy, I, I hope to submit an article one day completely calling out a colleague, and criticizing the care, and then <laughs> superimposing a case where I did very well in my own opinion to a major medical journal. Yeah. Most we should bring, we should bring this back. This would be, this would be healthy for everybody. It'd be great. All right. That's a, that's a fun case. This this concept of the skull is sort of an internal helmet kind of intuitively makes sense to me. Like if you have a skull fracture, but it doesn't actually injure the brain, it's like, okay, well you survived that. But it just is such a fine margin of error. Like that easily, that case easily could have been just awful. Right. Well, and look, look at the modern perspective. You're sitting in the emergency department. Somebody comes in with a similar injury. Aaron or Mike, are you guys digging out skull pieces? Uh, no, nope. Nope, 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 nope. nope. For the most part, you leave it alone, you know, depending on whether there's bleeding or something else that necessitates going to an operating room. I mean, I'm sure they'll fish out skull pieces sterilely in those cases, but uh, don't go poking around in there. Most of these do heal. No, nope. Don't poke around in the open skull fracture. Definitely true. Well, that's all the learning for today. 
that this podcast made your day just a little bit better. We'd appreciate, again, now that we're published, if you could be sure to rate us highly. We'll take stars, thumbs up, what have you. We expect to be on more podcast directories in the coming weeks, so look out for us then. Or, again, I guess you already found us, so tell other people to look out for us. It would make more sense there. Until next time, we would like to wish everyone good health. And uh, Aaron, do your new catchphrase that you came up with. Wait, I, I did? Which phrase? Damn it, Aaron. Wait, <laughs> was it? <laughs> I forgot it already. Was it D's nuts? <laughs> <laughs> Got him. No. It was. It was. You know, it's the last time we assigned anything to Aaron. Uh, oh, I think was that an assignment? D's oh, Jesus. nuts. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Mike, for coming through for us. Oh, and, and everybody, I wish you all good health and D's nuts. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I don't have a catchphrase. Hey, oh, okay. Right. Damn it! That was a good one. Yes. have an assignment i just wanted to see how you handled that <laughs> there you I go that, up and that the you saw my coping strategy it's it's fold under pressure and hope that the teacher likes me enough because of my general pleasing manner that they don't fire me that that's a perfect sign off phrase i love it <laughs> you can put it on a t-shirt <laughs> if you'd like to get your t-shirt with i don't remember what Aaron said. <laughs> it was fold under pressure and hope the teacher <laughs> likes you enough to not fire you yeah that's... see it's a sign <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right we'll call that a wrap somebody turned down the birds